The Cinderella effect is different forms of child abuse and mistreatment by step-parents other than by biological parents. It takes its name from the fairy tale character Cinderella, which is about a girl who was mistreated by her stepsisters and stepmother. Psychologists describe the effect as a byproduct of conflict between reproductive partners of investing in young that are unrelated to one partner. As we all know, the majority of step-parents are beautiful people and bond with their stepchildren and love them as if the child was their own, but also keeps healthy boundaries in not forgetting that they are not the replacement mom or dad, but the bonus parent. But there is the darker, sinister individuals that think they have to control the family dynamics, and they first start with alienating the biological mother or father. Narcissistic step-parents are dangerous because after they annihilate the bio-parent and family, they will set their sights on the child. Because in their mind, the child represents a relationship their spouse used to be in, and the thought of their spouse ever showing affection and intimacy with another person infuriates them. This type of manipulative personality can even convince their spouse that it's in the best interest of their own family dynamics to get rid of the ex and often the child. They often try violently forcing or mentally manipulating the child. Sometimes it is done directly or indirectly by employing others to do their dirty deeds for them. A targeted child or children in most cases is the stepchild. The biological children usually go unharmed if there is a non-biological child available to manipulate or abuse. The child may be timid, high-strung, or have physical, mental, or emotional handicaps. It doesn't matter to a narcissist if they decide they have to go, by all means necessary, even if it's in death or causing a child's disappearance directly or indirectly. Tonight we're starting off with a little boy who we are going to call Baby Duke due to the fact that the horrific abuse that took place the child's real name was withheld to the news media. If it is possible to be born soulless, Danielle Miller would be the poster child for soulless. Danielle Miller and Nathan Duke both faced felony charges. Danielle is accused of forcing a boy to eat laxatives and hot sauce, binding the boy's legs for hours, and locking him in a padded closet for hours, according to a news release from the Lancaster County District Attorney's Office. After a concerned acquaintance reported the suspected abuse to authorities, the police began to investigate, uncovering the hell one child was put through over a four-month period, but the boy wasn't one of the mother's three biological children. The tortured child was Danielle's stepson, who was in the sole custody of Danielle and his father, Nate. It was determined that in addition to feeding the child laxatives simply for being another woman's child, Miller also forced him to consume hot sauce, pouring it into his mouth and refusing to give him water for long periods of time. According to police, Danielle would also make the boy sit on a toilet for hours until he defecated, calling him a effing pig and telling him he had a stupid effing ugly face. As if that wasn't bad enough, she would bind the boy with a sheet and duct tape and call it playing mermaid. When she locked him in the closet, she would scratch on the walls and tell him it was a rat coming to get him. Danielle Miller would also inflict bruises, lacerations, and burns onto the little boy, and law enforcement officials believe it was all because the stepmom was resentful of the boy, abusing him because you know why? He was the offspring of her long-term live-in boyfriend with another woman. Validating the belief that Danielle inflicted her torture on the four-year-old because he was not hers, it was discovered that Danielle and Duke's 
three biological children who lived with a couple were not abused. He was the targeted stepchild. Sadly, his father did nothing to stop the abuse. Instead, he intentionally ignored it, telling the police that he did not seek medical attention for the child or report his son's injuries because he knew his bruises, burns, and lacerations would look like the outcome of child abuse. For his part of the ongoing torture that his son endured, Nathan Duke was jailed on a $100,000 bond and charged with endangerment and conspiracy charges for concealing the abuse and doing nothing to protect his child. The victim was taken away from the couple and placed in the care of extended family, and the other three children were placed under the care of Children's Services when their parents were thrown in jail for the abuse of their half-brother. Thank God that someone spoke up and was the voice for this little boy. Who knows how long this would have gone on if someone did not step in and say something. If you see something, you say something. A person did in this case, and it likely saved this little boy's life. Danielle Miller was ordered to court on all but one charge a summary count of harassment that was withdrawn after waiving her preliminary hearing according to court records. The boy's father, Nathan Duke, waived the court felony charges of conspiracy to commit aggravated assault and endangering the welfare of a child. Police said he failed to stop or report the abuse that was being done to his child. Miller is now charged with five counts of aggravated assault, false imprisonment, unlawful restraint, endangering the welfare of a child, terrestrial threats, reckless endangerment, and harassment. She remains in the Lancaster County Prison on $300,000 bail. Nathan Duke's bail was reduced at the hearing from $100,000 to $25,000 bail. By waiving their hearings, the couple did not admit guilt, but prosecutors have enough evidence for a trial. Some cases make you wonder how much pain can the mind and body of a child take. In this case, all they have are each other. Ashley Swartup faces up to life in prison on the first degree charge and 10 years in prison on the second degree charge. The father of the twins took one of the girls to Bronston Battle Creek Hospital on December 16, 2019 for treatment. Doctors notified police after finding severe bruising and swelling to both sides of the girl's face, as well as bruises on her arms, front, and back side of her torso and a bloody lower lip. The girl said her stepmother was angry because the child was not doing her chores and grabbed her by her hair and banged her head up against the wall and floor. The girl said the woman also twisted her arm behind her back and told the girl she would break it. When the stepmom was questioned, she told police she has seizures and does not recall the incident. She said she remembers being angry at the girl about homework and chores, but blacked out and remembers nothing until she was on the bathroom floor and her husband was over her. However, the girl said her stepmother was talking to her when the reported assault first began. During the investigation, the twin sister told police she had been pushed off the toilet and into the bathtub a couple of days earlier, and police sought the charge of second-degree child abuse for the reported incident. The twins said they have been assaulted before and reported being punched in the stomach and having their hair pulled from their scalps. A third girl, eight years old, did not report any abuse. The children have been placed with other family members and the case is being investigated by CPS and also is before the Family Division of the Calhoun County Circuit Court. But this is not the first person to abuse these twins. In June 2015, Matthew Williams of Coldwater, Michigan, was living with his girlfriend, is being charged with two counts of criminal sexual conduct and child abuse involving his girlfriend's twin two-year-old daughters. The twins' mother was also arrested for lying to police during the course of the investigation when asked if Williams had ever been left alone with her daughters. She was not overly concerned because a friend of hers was also at the home while Williams was upstairs changing the girls' diapers. When the twins visited their natural father, 
his girlfriend and his mother that day. After finding blood in the girls' diapers, they were taken to the Community Health Center, a Branch County emergency room for sexual assault. While there, a sexual assault nurse examinator found bruises and probable penetration of the children. The mother of the twins had told the children's father that the little girls have been exploring themselves roughly, so they were swollen and red, and there was blood in the diapers when he picked them up. Williams and Miller had been living together for four months. She was pregnant with Williams' baby at the time of the incident. She later said she lied for Williams because she was scared of him. The friend that was at the residence that day later testified that Williams took the girls upstairs to a bedroom to change their diapers. After Goodman heard a scream, he found Williams on the bed holding one of the girls by her legs and saw visible signs of trauma. Why did he not call the police? The mother pled guilty in September of 2015, served 30 days in jail, and was on probation for two years for giving Williams an alibi and said he had never been with the girls alone. Williams was charged with two counts of first degree CSC and child abuse involving both of her twin daughters but after he entered a plea of no contest to third-degree criminal sexual conduct for the sexual assault of two twin two-year-old girls. He only faced a maximum 15 years in prison with a maximum 10-year prison possible. Life felony, first-degree, CSC charges, and a second-degree child abuse charge, a 10-year felony enhanced as a habitual offender, was reduced to 15 years because of the 2013 conviction for larceny were dismissed with a plea. This is absolutely no justice for these girls. Jordan Blymeyer. Jordan came to live with his father and step-siblings not long after his father married Tammy Blymeyer. His biological mother and father never went to court to establish custody or visitation for Jordan, she dropped him off at his grandparents' house over two years prior to the abuse, but was picked up by his father, which would not return him. Tammy Blymeyer already had five children, when three men, when she married Brad Blymeyer. The couple married and had another child, and she was pregnant with her seventh child when she was arrested for abuse. At first, he was treated the same as Tammy's other children, including her five-year-old son, then Jordan started getting disciplined more often for more things with harsher punishments. It started with longer periods in time out and quickly escalated. Soon after, his father and stepmother took away his pajamas, then his pillow, and finally his mattress as punishments. They started sending him to the Harry Potter room. The Harry Potter room was an unfinished closet under the stairs with a concrete floor exposed nails and wiring leading to a crawl space where he spent many hours. Then it became days. His step-siblings were forbidden from opening the door to check on him. He had to stay in there wearing only a diaper as punishment, sometimes for days. During these months, prosecutors said Brad began beating the boy at Tammy's direction. Jordan was also allegedly drugged to keep him quiet when guests were over. It's been stated that Tammy was a master of manipulation. Withholding food became the next level of punishment. It's been said that Tammy did not serve many hot meals to her family. When food was served, it was usually out of a fast food bag. When Jordan was being punished, he was not allowed to eat any food. His siblings were forbidden to give him any of their food while he sat and watched them eat. In January of 2014, Tammy's 16-year-old could not take watching the abuse any longer and began telling what was going on. Finally, the police showed up at the house one day, but his mother was able to convince investigators there wasn't a problem. It was stated Jordan had recently been sent to Ohio to live with relatives and had returned looking healthier than ever. Child Protective Services visited the Blymeyer's home after being alerted about the problem in February, about a month before the day of reckoning on March 28th. 
Jordan's stepsister and stepbrother were fed up with having to sneak him food when their mother wasn't looking. Then one day, his 16-year-old stepbrother went to the tiny room under the stairs and see Jordan's horrible state and knew he would not survive much longer. His face was all caved in with bruises all over him. Jordan was foaming at the mouth. His stepbrother got him out of the tiny little cubby hole and handed him to his sister while he called the police. His mother and stepfather were furious and he had opened that door without their permission, of course. The 16-year-old ran outside and started shouting to the neighbors to come over. When police arrived at the Blymeyer's home, thinking they were there to break up a fist fight between a rowdy 16-year-old and his stepfather, they had no idea of the horrors they would find. Just before the police arrived, Tammy left with Jordan and refused to bring him back. Investigators then used cell phone records to track her to a nearby motel where they found Jordan with Tammy. Jordan was found covered in bumps and bruises and severely underweight. He was rushed to a nearby hospital where a pediatrician said he had suffered severe physical abuse and habitual starvation. Doctors said Jordan, who only weighed 29 pounds at the time, had nearly starved to death. They compared his state of malnutrition to a Holocaust survivor. Prosecutors later revealed that Jordan was not allowed to eat at the dinner table with his siblings who were all Tammy Blymeyer's children. He was the only one that could not eat at the dinner table. He was only given a slice of bread to eat a day, which would be taken away if he did not eat it quickly enough. His stepbrother also told authorities that someone slammed Jordan's head against the wall and even used a stun gun on him. After the arrest of the Blymeyer's, CPS took custody of the Blymeyer's other children her newborn was given to foster care. Tammy Blymeyer sentenced to prison for 28 years for abusing her stepson. Her husband, Bradley Blymeyer, was sentenced to 15 years in prison in a plea deal for his role in the neglect, starvation, and physical attacks that included electrical shocks from a taser. Tammy Blymeyer may have resented Jordan because he was the only child in the household who was not her biological child. She may have been jealous of her husband's love for his son or because he once had feelings for Jordan's mother. Jordan's biological mother said she and her relatives had made numerous attempts over the years to get her son back, but were told there was little that they could do because she and the boy's father did not have a court-ordered custody agreement. She had also said that she reached out to CPS Jordan's mother says she has fought tirelessly to get her son back and even went to Tammy's home in effort to see him. She stated, I left notes on the door. I went over there with police officers. They wouldn't answer the door. They wouldn't answer my phone calls. They wouldn't reply to my text messages. She filed a motion with the Attorney General's office. It took them almost eight months to get me a court date, she stated adding that she also messaged Tammy on Facebook, begging for visits with Jordan. Jordan is alive today because of the courageous actions of his step-siblings. More people should stand up for abused children. Jackson Love, the love child that was hated. When another man or woman steps into the picture, it can cause serious tension, and instead of keeping the children out of it, the children are used as bargaining chips. In some cases, a jealous step-parent can feel ill towards any children who aren't biologically theirs, leaving the little ones stuck between a rock and a hard place. Unfortunately for Jackson Love, his stepmother's hatred of his mother left him fighting for his life in the hospital, where he later died to his injuries. Documents indicate that Maynard's animosity towards the child's mother steamed from the birth of Jackson, which was a result of a long-standing affair. According to child welfare investigative documents, Chelsea allegedly admitted to County Child Protective Services officials that she threw the boy high in the air at her home in Stockton, California, and purposely let him fall on his head in anger over her husband's affair with Jackson's mother. Chelsea 
allegedly told officials that just before Christmas of 2016, she beat Jackson with a toy bat while her husband Willard was away, leaving the toddler with marks on his butt as well as discoloration on his legs and thighs. A few weeks before Jackson's death, Chelsea said that she held Jackson under the water, holding him down by his neck. Jackson was squirming, the documents show. Chelsea said when she saw herself holding him underwater, she stopped and asked herself what was she doing. She also stated that she felt depressed and devastated after learning of her husband's affair and that just by looking at Jackson, especially after Willard received joint custody of Jackson, reminded her of Willard's cheating and made her remember how mad she was about everything. Jackson's dad told his mother that he had a trampoline accident. I just can't believe some of this. He fell but was completely fine. Woke up in the morning, which would be the Wednesday morning, and he was fine. Then around 12 o'clock, he had a bath and took a nap afterward. The dad went out and did some errands and left the baby with his wife, she said. Later that day, Jackson's father came home and found his son unresponsive. The toddler was taken to a Stockton hospital and later transferred to Children's Hospital in Oakland, California, where doctors say he was bleeding in the brain and had a broken ribs. Chelsea Maynard was charged with felony child abuse endangerment, felony corporal injury to a child, and inflicting great bodily harm that resulted in Jackson's death. Jackson's abuse and death could have been avoided by simply getting a divorce. I'm not going to cry. I'm not. Was Serenity's last words. On November 25th, 2018, Court records say the surveillance camera in the family Stockton home showed Zuma Chavez yelling at her four-year-old stepdaughter Serenity Moore and her two siblings from a couch. Serenity is later grabbed and dragged by Zoma into a bedroom and out of sight of the camera. The camera is able to pick up Zoma Chavez telling Serenity, You're going to cry. You're going to cry, according to court documents. The four-year-old's last words were, I'm not going to cry. I'm not. Records say the camera then picked up the little girl's screams before there was a horrific thud, and shortly after, the crying stops. Zoma called Serenity's father, Kevin Carmen Sr., who later told officials the girl had hit her head after running into a bed. Serenity was taken to UC Davis Medical Center with a brain bleed. She later died at the hospital. Court records show hospital staff noted several other healing injuries on Serenity's body that were consistent with being abused. Court documents also show Chavez and Carmes lied about the four-year-old's injuries, saying she ran into a ladder attached to a bunk bed. Chavez later confessed to causing the injury, but said that it was an accident. Serenity's biological mother said her ex-boyfriend had custody of their three young kids, According to the biological mother and information from court documents, Serenity's five-year-old brother told officials their stepmother slapped, kicked, and stomped on them. Carmes, the children's father, was also arrested in January of 2019 on suspicion of felony child abuse. The felony charges against Carmes were later dropped, and in 2019, he pled guilty to one count of misdemeanor child endangerment. He was given four years of formal probation. Zoma Chavez received 15 to 20 years for taking a child's life. The punishment does not equal the crime. Mackenzie Mason, she was five years old. She was the brightest little girl, very independent, beautiful, and she was my world. These are the words of a heartbroken mother of Mackenzie. In 2013, the mother of Mackenzie and Michaela had lost custody of her two daughters and they would go live with their father, Andrew. She had lost custody of Mackenzie and Michaela to Andrew Mason about two years prior to Mackenzie's death after a domestic disturbance and jail time. Their mother said she attempted to visit the girls between 2013 and May of 2015, but she either wasn't allowed to see them or she was told they weren't home. They were too busy working or they just weren't there. It seems family and friends see the signs of child abuse but refused to acknowledge it in some cases. 
In May of 2015, a 911 call was made in the case of a child who was in need of help. Police arrived to find Mackenzie Mason was unresponsive and she was transported to the hospital. Mackenzie was unable to be resuscitated and later she was pronounced dead. The staff at the hospital worked on her for 45 minutes trying to save her but was unsuccessful. Mackenzie's cause of death was dehydration and malnutrition, which was complicated by the fact that she had a very bad case of pneumonia. Mackenzie's temperature, which was taken at the hospital, was far below what it would have been for someone who had only been unresponsive for a short period of time. In 2013, Mackenzie had visited the doctor and she weighed 28 pounds and had dropped to 27 pounds, 8 ounces in 2014. Mackenzie did not visit the doctor again before she passed. At the time of her death, Mackenzie weighed only 25 pounds, had pneumonia, and was suffering with a very bad infection. Michaela, who was 3 years old, weighed only 17 pounds, where a normal-sized 3-year-old should weigh about 30 pounds, and a 5-year-old should weigh about 40 pounds. The girls were severely neglected and denied food and nourishment over courses of weeks to months. There were two other children living in the home, the biological children of the stepmom, whose ages are 10 and 1. The other children in the home were healthy, unlike Mackenzie and Michaela. The facts are clear why these two children were treated differently than the other two. There was evidence of foul play present at the scene, Mackenzie also had healing bruises on her little body. Andrew and Hillary Mason were charged with murder, torture, and child abuse. Prosecutors said that the abuse and neglect of Mackenzie and Michaela was ongoing and intentional on the part of Andrew and Hillary. The abuse suffered by the girls left Michaela in the hospital and Mackenzie was dead. In January of 2016, Andrew and Hillary were in court, charged and found guilty of felony murder, first-degree child abuse, and torture. The jurors were shown pictures of bruises on Mackenzie's head, face, legs, feet, and body, were shown in various stages of healing. Not only is this child not have been given an appropriate means to survive, there were also signs of physical abuse. On March 10, 2016, Judge Daniel Kelly stated in court that Mackenzie's case was the third case of a child abuse death taking place at the hands of parents and step-parents. Judge Daniel Kelly sentenced Andrew and Hillary to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Defense lawyers had asked for a prison term in years for the abuse and torture charges, but the judge gave each of them life for those charges as well. It did not happen overnight. It did not happen in the period of a few weeks. This took months to get to the point that these children were in the grave state that they were in. How parents could not only allow that to happen, but to purposely cause that to happen, that's a specific kind of evil. On a brighter note, Michaela is back with her biological mother and is slowly overcoming the abuse and neglect. It was reported she was gaining weight and eats anything she puts in front of her. She knows her angel sister is watching over her. The next story is very graphic in nature. Natalie and Chase DeBlaze were tortured and murdered by their father, John DeBlaze, and his girlfriend, Heather Lavelle Keaton. Prosecutors had claimed that Heather Lavelle Keaton was jealous of the children's mother. Natalie and Chase unquestionably led a disturbing life filled with torture and abuse. Tragically, at the young ages of three and four, these children's lives were taken from them. John and Natalie, Chase's father, and Heather, the girlfriend, have been charged with the children's murders. It took no time for the two to start pointing fingers at each other, claiming the other abused and murdered Natalie and Chase. Heather abused the two young children on a daily basis. Her weapon of choice? Duct tape. She would duct tape little Natalie's hands and arms to the side of her body, 
duct tape her mouth closed with a sock in it and placed her in a suitcase in a cupboard for up to 14 hours. I can't imagine the horror the little girl must have felt. Chase would also have his hands and arms duct taped to both sides of his body and a sock shoved in his mouth with duct tape over it. But rather than being put in a suitcase, he would have a broomstick taped to the back of him and was then forced to stand in the corner for hours while the rest of the family went to bed. John knew of the torture his children were forced to endure and did absolutely nothing to stop it. When Heather and John got tired of dishing out the abuse, they decided they wanted less responsibility. They came to the conclusion that murdering Natalie and Chase was a great way to get rid of the responsibility. Heather, who suffers from vision loss, allegedly made a jailhouse confession to fellow inmates at the Mobile County Jail in Alabama. The inmate was assigned to help Heather because of her blindness, and she began to talk about the case. She said that she and John, her common-law husband, poisoned the two small children with antifreeze. She even stated that they practiced on the family's dog before poisoning the children to see how long it took to kill a living thing. She claimed that they poisoned Natalie first, and after Chase began crying, asking for his sister in front of people, they poisoned him as well. At a court hearing, Heather changed her story and claimed that John fed rat poison to the children. Natalie died on March 4, 2010. After Natalie's death, the couple stopped poisoning Chase for a few months, but started right back at it when he was determined to be in an inconvenience and witness to his sister's murder. Chase died on June 20, 2010. John told investigators they dumped the children's bodies and covered them with twigs. Chase's skeletal remains were found buried near Van Cleve, Mississippi, after John revealed their location to investigators. Natalie's remains were discovered three days later near Cintronale, Alabama. John and Heather are charged with two counts of felony murder and two counts of corpse abuse each. Both monsters pled not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. After evaluations, both were found to be competent to stand trial. Both received the death sentence by lethal injection, which is too good for both of them. At the time of the children's death, Heather was pregnant with the couple's daughter. She was placed in state custody after her birth. Greg Hughes Lavelle, Keaton's attorney, argued that his client should be spared the punishment because she's a spiritual person now. She's into reading the Bible and writing songs and poems, and she keeps to herself, he stated. Believing in God, being forgiven for your sins don't mean you shall go unpunished in this life or the next. She took two lives from this earth. She can only pay for one with her own life. Haley Cummings disappeared out of her Saxon, Florida home in the middle of the night in February 2009 while sleeping next to her three-year-old brother. The last person to see her alive was her father's 17-year-old girlfriend at the time, Misty Croslin. At first, the 17-year-old Croslin told deputies she realized Haley was missing when she woke up in the early morning hours of February 10, 2009 and noticed the back door of the home was propped open with a cylinder block. The back door, she insisted, was locked when she had gone to sleep hours earlier. The investigators working the case found no sign of forced entry. There was nothing at the scene that indicated any type of foul play. Haley Cummings' little brother told police that a man dressed in all black snuck into the room and snatched the five-year-old girl from her bed. Haley's father, Ronald Cummings, was at work at the time and reported his child missing when he got home that evening. Ronald had primary custody of Haley and her little brother. Haley's biological mother was incarcerated at the time of Haley's disappearance but had visitation rights to the children. On March 12, 2009, Cummings and Croslin marry in the yard of a friend's mobile home. Misty Croslin 
changed her story and said she saw her brother and cousin take Haley's lifeless body out of the house and to the river, then recanted her statement. The night that Haley was reported missing, phone records show her dad tried to reach Misty 20 times. When Ronald Cummings could not reach Misty Croslin, he called her brother Hank, Tommy Croslin Jr., and asked him to check on the family. Law enforcement officials have stated, Hank Croslin recently told investigators that the house was dark and no one answered the door when he banged on it. Then a tip came in that Misty was at a party that night with the children. It says Haley got into some Oxycontin and overdose. The male friend put her back in a black bag, then into a friend's car, and they took her to a pond, the tip said. The pond was drained and dragged, but Haley wasn't in the pond. October 7, 2009, Ronald Cummings and Misty Croslin announced they were getting a divorce. Ronald Cummings blames the stress of Haley's disappearance and his contradictions his wife has given to her account of what happened on the night of the disappearance. Croslin and Cummings, or anyone else, have ever faced charges for Haley's disappearance. The couple was arrested years later in a drug sting and sent to prison, where they remain today. Misty Croslin was sentenced to a maximum mandatory 25 years in prison, imposed a $500,000 in state mandate fines and ordered drug offender probation when she is released. Ronald Cummings was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Family told a media outlet that the biological mother now has custody of her son. What really happened that night? Some blame Misty's age, that she was not mature enough to handle the responsibility of two young children. She was only 17 years old. Others have speculated that Haley was the targeted child because she had a genetic abnormality known as Turner Syndrome that affects one in every 2,500 female babies born alive and is marked by features ranging from major heart defects to minor cosmetic indicators, development delays, nonverbal learning disabilities, and behavioral problems. Haley has two brown birthmarks on her left cheekbone and right jawbone. Her fingers and toes are chubbier than most children's. Her left eye is slightly smaller and unaligned, a condition called lazy eye. She also is below average height for her age. She was about three feet tall. She also had a slight speech impairment, possibly learning disability and a behavioral issue. No suspects have been named in Haley's case. In other cases though, children that have some sort of disability are singled out from the other children or child in the family and are more vulnerable to abuse being mental or physical and or death by caregivers. County and state law enforcement, many SARS search and rescue Texas extra search have put in many hours searching for Haley. Unfortunately, Haley has never been seen or heard of since that night. Haley Cummings' information at the time of her disappearance was on February 10th, 2009. She's from Statsom, Florida, Putnam County. Her birthday is August 17th, 2003. She disappeared at five years old. She's three feet tall, she's white with blonde hair and brown eyes, and she weighs approximately 39 pounds. A Florida Amber Alert was issued for Haley Cummings, who was last seen in the area of Hermit's Cove in Zapsom, Florida. She was last seen wearing a pink shirt and underwear. FDLE Missing Endangered Persons Information Clearing House is 1-888-FL. Missing. If you have any information concerning the whereabouts of Haley, please contact the Putnam County Sheriff's Office at 386 329 0808 or call 911. 
Serenity Denard disappeared from the Black Hills Children's Home Society on February 3, 2019. She was there on accusations made by her stepmother that took her to a psychiatric hospital only months prior to her admittance to the home. Due to suicidal threats, or so the stepmother has stated, Serenity later reported it was not a suicide attempt. She was trying to learn to tie a ribbon and accidentally got it in a knot. The stepmother came into her room and seen the knot, then started screaming at Serenity out of frustration. When Serenity had enough of being screamed at, she told her stepmother sarcastically, Yes, I'm trying to kill myself, so I don't have to look at your ugly face again. The stepmother took her to a psychiatric hospital for saying this and then was placed at the children's home shortly after. The frustration of the stepmom was an ongoing problem in the household. After alienating Serenity's adoptive mom and biological family, rumors of abuse started surfacing about abuse in the home. Court documents show Serenity was removed from the home two years prior of being placed in the children's home. Serenity told authorities the treatment she had been receiving in her parents' home. Her stepsister and adoptive brother confirmed what Serenity was saying was true. Serenity said she has a door alarm on her bedroom door at home. If she has an accident at night, she's not allowed out of her room the whole day. Documents show that Serenity was made to wear a pull-up. If she wet her pull-up, she's made to wear it the following day. Yes, the same pull-up. She would only be given baby food to eat. Oatmeal cereal made with cold water if she wet her pull-up because she was viewed as a baby by her adoptive dad and stepmom. She was made to say, oh, yummy baby food, every bite she ate when she was made to eat it. On weekends, Serenity was made to stand in the corner and only fed the baby food and watch the other two children eat regular meals with the rest of the family. She gave examples of the food like fried chicken and ribs. Once she had a headache so bad that she threw up and was made to clean up her own vomit, then forced to eat more baby food. Also, if she wet her pole up, she was given cold baths. She said it seemed the water was colder with each accident that she had and dumping cold water on her head to rinse her hair out, the document stated. It was reported Serenity wore a urine-saturated pole up to school. She was afraid to sit down, scared the urine would seep out through the sides. She was told by her stepmother that she could not pull it off until she was a big girl. When visited at school, it was reported Serenity's eyes were dark and weak. She looked pale and tired. The school stated Serenity would eat four times more than the average child during lunchtime and would shake while she ate. When the stepmother was confronted with the observation and allegations, she would come up with an excuse that could possibly be acceptable but was locked in on punishing Serenity for her accidents. The document stated there had been several previous reports made to DSS about the way Serenity was being treated and the adult's parenting techniques with the male treatment and dispelling being used on the child. When the home was visited, it was observed that the family had plenty of food and there was no reason for food to be withheld from Serenity. Food was being withheld as punishment. When the other children in the home were questioned, they stated they had large meals and plenty of extra helpings, unlike Serenity. It was also stated that Serenity was being refused snow pants because she lost one little knitted glove on the school bus. South Dakota winters are brutally cold, so the school found her a pair to wear while at school. Serenity was also told she would not get a new pair of gloves because she had lost one, so the school bought her a new pair. The stepmom was mad the school was allowing her to go out to recess and also for replacing her winter essentials because this was supposed to be part of the punishment 
that she was receiving at home. So food and essential clothing were being withheld from this child. Excessive exercise, such as wall sits, was used as punishment. If she failed her spelling practice test at home, she would have to do extreme numbers of wall sits to the point of having sore legs the following day. In conclusion, the documents stated the concerns they had with the amount and methods of discipline that was being used in Serenity's case, and that the fact the stepmother had no parenting skills and the adopted dad was just going along with whatever the stepmother said. It was said the adopted dad needed to be motivated to be a better advocate for his child. It has been reported that this child had reactive attachment disorder. RAD, and ADD, but the documents stated that per adopted father. They did not show proof of this diagnosis. The documents stated the child was removed from the home for an amount of time, then returned. It has been said the adopted father and stepmother had to take parenting classes, which it's obvious that it did absolutely nothing because Serenity was checked into the psychiatric hospital for false accusations of suicidal tendencies. Documents show they alienated her adopted mother shortly after Serenity's father became involved with her now stepmother. On February 2, 2019, Serenity was visited by her family, one of the few visits after entering the home. On February 3, 2019, she walked out of the school's gym after telling her friend she was going somewhere beautiful. She walked down the sidewalk to the road and stood there for 30 minutes, then disappeared forever. 911 was called an hour and a half later. The home received a slap on the hand for their actions, or should I say lack of actions that day. Serenity June Denard was nine years old when she walked away from the Black Hills Children's Home in Rockerville, South Dakota on February 3rd. 2019. Her height at the time was 4 foot 7 inches tall. She weighed approximately 90 pounds. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. She was last seen wearing a long gray sleeve shirt with flowers on it, blue jeans, and black snow boots. If you have any information in regards to Serenity's whereabouts, please contact the Pennington County Sheriff's Department at 605-394-6100. 15 or 911. Kyron Horman disappeared from Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon on June 4, 2010, after attending a science fair with his stepmother. Local and state police, along with the FBI, conducted a extensive search for Horman and launched a criminal investigation, but have not uncovered any significant information regarding the child's whereabouts. His disappearance sparked the largest criminal investigation in Oregon's history. As of 2020, his whereabouts remain unknown. Terry, the stepmother, has denied any involvement in Kyron's disappearance and has never been named a suspect in the case. However, Horman failed two separate polygraph tests around the time of Kyron's disappearance. It was also said she messaged a friend telling them Kyron was the reason for her failing marriage. Terry was the last person to see Kyron, and it's believed, but not proven, Kyron left with Terry that morning from the school. He never made it home. Parents, teachers, and children said they only seen him with Terry that morning, and she has a time lapse in her activities of the day he disappeared. A friend of Terry's left work around the same time that Terry has a time lapse of her unknown whereabouts. The friend did not notify the employer and no one could reach her by phone when called. Kyron Horman was 3 foot 7 inches tall, weighing 50 pounds, and was wearing a black t-shirt with a CSI logo painted green, also with a handprint on it, black cargo pants, and black tennis shoes with orange on them. If you have any information in regards to Kyron, please call the tip line at 503-261-2847 or call 911.
of Chiron's whereabouts. It seems withholding food, excessive exercise, and alienating the parent and family are the tortures of choice by psychopathic step-parents if physical abuse is not seen. There is so many children that have lost their lives at the hands of just step-parents, especially step-moms. Then there are those that have been and are currently being abused. Remember, mental and emotional abuse is just as serious as physical abuse. Seems some use exercise and withholding food as punishment. Instead of taking the life from the child, they slowly take their mind and soul. Please, if you know of a child that is being abused, please speak up. Call Child Protective Services or 911 for a well check. If you are a parent that's being alienated, it could be more serious than just the step parent not liking you. Your child's life can be in serious danger. Please keep pushing for your child and have law enforcement or CPS do routine visits. Your child may have been silenced, but you're not. Be the voice for your child. If you are a step parent and have a problem, with your spouse's child, remove yourself from the home and the child. The child did not ask to be in this situation, you did. To all the children that have battled or is battling your abuser, much love and prayers. May peace be with you all. Thank you for joining us. Subscribe to the Missing Truth channel to receive notifications and updates on news stories and many other